we're going to be talking about the uh, dual Zowie 10 gigabit Ethernet interface module. Uh, I'm, the region, I'm the national sales manager for Acromag, and Erica is the design engineer on the project. Erica, you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Well, we're here together, and we're going to start to give you a little bit of a tour of this, uh, of this new product and some of the technologies involved. So if we can get to the next page. The first thing we want to do is discuss what Zowie is. Um, Zowie is, is, is a term that's being used to describe this technology. We're also going to talk about what Zowie Communications is and why it's important. Uh, and, and a justification for how Zowie is used with, internet, with uh, Ethernet. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Zowie backplane and Ethernet switches, and we'll give you a little bit of a rundown on some of the configurations and redundancy and architectures that are available. We'll review the open systems interconnect. We'll talk about the resource requirements required to drive a TCP IP stack, um, and then we'll get right into the product and show you all of its uh, major advantages and, and how it can assist in, in uh, building applications high-performance applications for you. First, what is Zowie? And uh, it's spelled X-A-U-I, not Z-O-W-I-E, which is the way it sounds. And really what it is is the concatenation of the Roman numeral X, which means 10, and the initials of the attachment unit interface, A-U-I. So there you have it, Zowie. <clears throat> it's a standard for extending the full duplex 10 gigabit media inter, inter, independent interface, which extends between the MAC and the PHY layer of 10 gigabit Ethernet. And it extends that from a full 7 centimeters up to about 50 centimeters. The standard 8B, 10B coding is used. There's four lanes involved in a Zowie connection, and each of those lanes is running at 3.125 gigabits per second. When you take the four lanes together, it translates into 2.5 times 4, which will give you 10 gigabits per second. It's a very electrically similar to IEEE 10G base KX4. And the applications basically uh, make, it, make it possible for you to basically extend components uh, of 10 gigabit interface across a circuit board, like a VPX backplane or maybe an ATCA chassis. So basically it's a means of, rather than going out to wire, actually using the backplane in a chassis for communications. So why is 10 gigabit Zowie, which is Vita 42.6 communications, important? Well, it is a high-speed network and it interfaces across backplanes, no wires. The primary objective, of course, is to connect fast data generators and high-speed analysis and storage transmission engines without having to even go out of the chassis and basically have them all resident within a chassis. All of the standard protocols for software are followed, like TCP, IP, UDP, iSCSI, and FCOE. And the standards for hardware are 10G base KX4. And the big benefit is that it's a low pin count. There's four lanes, low power, low cost, it's compact, and then again, for rugged military type applications, no wires. Very, very important for uh, robustness of the, of the architecture. <clears throat> now, why was Zowie uh, invented and why did it come about? Well, for some time now, people have been using Rapid IO, Vita 42.2, or they've been using PCI Express, 42, Vita 42.3. And typically on top of these uh, electrical interfaces, they put proprietary software packages on top of those. And if you look at the specs for those, and here we can look at the 42.2 Serial Rapid I.O., you basically got two links, each comprised of four lanes at 3.125 gigabits per second, which gives you 20 gigabits per second overall, 2.5 gigabytes per second. If we look at PCI Express, and that would be Vita 42.3, you've got one link perhaps of eight lanes at 2.5 gigabits per second, 
gives you 16 gigabits per second or 2 gigabytes per second. If you look at Zowie, we've got two links, each link consisting of four lanes at 3.125 gigabits per second. Overall, that gives us 20 gigabits per second or 2.5 gigabytes per second of data transmission. Now, many times when the Zowie is used, it's connected to a switch, and the switch would probably come out with maybe 10 lanes of 1 gigab gigabit per second and probably Ethernet. So that would be 802.3 gigabit Ethernet and 10 links, and basically from one Zowie port you can get 10 1 gigabit Ethernet links. These 1 gigabit Ethernet links are very, very flexible and can be used in many, many different ways. Now some of the other reasons why Zowie was very, considered very, very valuable is the fact that it's an existing and a proven worldwide standard. Ethernet is very well known and the under integration costs are very, very well understood. And a lot of the networking experience that people have had to date using Internet and Ethernet um, all apply. And Zowie modules actually move very easily to XNC modules. And if you look at an XNC module here, this one seems to be mounted on a carrier board here. There's two connections on an XNC module, the P15 and the P16. P15 would usually handle your link 0 and link 1. There would be four lanes apiece. That would be on P15. Okay. And then on P16, which would be the other XNC connector, you would have links 2 and 3. So it's possible on an XMC module to have effectively up to four links of Zowie. <clears throat> now the other thing that really makes Zowie very, very uh, palatable is the fact that many Ethernet backplane configurations are possible when you use Zowie with switches. And we're going to talk about some of the configurations that you can generate when you use switches with a Zowie connection. Now what we're going to start with is Acromag's new XMC6260, CC for conduction cooling, and L slash LF for leaded or lead free. And you'll see that the card is here. It has a P15 and a P16 connector. The P15 connector on the implementation that we did has eight PCIe lanes which talk back to the CPU. And then off of the P16 connector we've got two groups of Zowie lanes, and each of those is four Zowie lanes apiece. And we're bringing those out to a switch. And perhaps from that switch we're going to get gigabit Ethernet out. Okay? Let's concentrate on the area where we have the Zowie lanes and the switches and see some of the things that we can do with uh, those gigabit Ethernet communications networks. The first thing we can do is we can create something called a star network and this is where the switch talks directly to a number of different modules directly on a point-to-point -point basis. This is probably one of the most popular uses of this, of this uh, device and the, the way that many architectures, especially in VPX and, and the like, would be using uh, this type of uh, technology they would be talking point to point to a number of different devices off of a single switch. Another way that you can use these Zowie lanes is come off with a switch and actually use gigabit Ethernet where you have multiple devices talking on a single gigabit Ethernet communications network. This is possible because gigabit Ethernet is running on CSMACD and basically uh, you can support quite a number of nodes on a single uh, gigabit Ethernet network. Now, one of the things you can do with these configurations is we can generate some levels of redundancy. Now, if we look at a redundant backplane configuration, we can look at a star, which we started off with, coming off of the switch. We can do some redundancy if, for instance, you were to put two, gig, two Ethernet lanes coming off to each of the cards. And this would be redundancy off of the same switch. Now it's possible that you have a second switch. And if we add the second switch, we can also have switch redundancy as well. 
And if you had switch redundancy, you can have those same modules likewise talk to a second switch. So now, not only do you have network redundancy, but you also have switch redundancy. When you look at a redundant backplane configuration, and here we're looking at the network configuration, we talked about this earlier. We've got a switch, we've got gigabit Ethernet lanes, and we've got a number of devices talking right now all on the same gigabit Ethernet network. If we do redundancy on the same switch, we could pick up a second gigabit Ethernet network, and we could actually have those devices each talking to two networks. And some switchover criteria would have to be devised to make sure that, you know, which network you were looking at at any point in time. But you could also, by adding a second switch, go ahead and add switch redundancy in this very same way. So there's a lot of flexibility that you can do with uh, the Zowie card and switches. These switches can actually uh, route multiple gigabit Ethernet lanes into the back plane, or they could come off of a rear transition module and they could be coming out into the open space world uh, as field I.O. Just to review a little bit what the standard open systems interconnect, the OSI standard is, it's a seven layer model. It's been around for quite a number of years now. <clears throat> and when we're talking about Ethernet or we're talking about fiber or we're talking about a radio transmission, we're looking at the physical layer which is down at the bottom. The layer immediately above that is the media access control layer. This is where uh, reliable transmission of packets from a node to node is done on a station address basis. The next layer is the network layer where you may be bridging between different local area networks or wide area networks. We have the transport layer, ensures the delivery of an entire file or an entire message. The session layer stops and starts different processes, different applications that you may have be go going on. The presentation layer basically makes sure that the data coming out of the transmission protocol before it reaches the applications layer is in the format that the applications layer can actually use it. And then, of course, the application, which could be a mail server, it could be a digital signal processing application, or whatever you might make it out to be. This is a pretty intensive body of software and logic that needs to be executed. And the, the implementation resource requirements are really, really heavy from layers 3 through 6. Tremendous amount of CPU usage is consumed, a lot of RAM, and a lot of bus speed is, is used in those areas. So we know that in order to implement the full TCP IP OSI stack, that there's a hardware interface, and there's a resource intensive software protocol that needs to be executed. So what are some of the implementation scenarios that are very, very popular to do that? Well, the first is to use a CPU to drive the OSI stack. I mean, everybody's got a CPU today, and just take a little bit of the memory out of there and drive the stack, and everything is fine, or maybe not so fine, because that's a lot of software to execute. And then there's something called a CPU using the OSI enhanced performance architecture. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then there's also the use of a silicon stack, a hardware a TCP offload engine, as it's more commonly called, or tow engine. So if we look at CPU execution of the TCP IP stack, what we're looking at is if we take a single core computer, for instance, we hog out a, a bit of its resource, and this resource is both memory and it's actually CPU horsepower, so to speak. So we're using that basically to drive the TCP IP stack. Single core computers were very, very popular. Today, of course, we have multi-core computers. And today, in many cases, what you have is people saying, if I need to execute a communication stack, let me put that in a core all by itself. So by putting it in a core all by itself, basically you can dedicate a core to doing the communications protocol and in the single CPU, you had only the remainder left for the application. Here, you still got in a four-core CPU, you got three cores available to do applications work, which is a really great advancement. Now, some of the other things that people do to gain 
better throughput and better performance, of course you can increase the CPU performance. Today, your computers are running anywhere from 1.53 gigahertz, 1.86 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, 2.5 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, and then there's multiple cores to go along with it. The other way to uh, get better performance is to minimize what it is that you're doing in the TCP IP stack. And this is a tack that's taken by a lot of people. And here's the, the normal seven layer stack. And you'll see here that what they've done is they've taken layers three through six and they've done a streamlining process here where the Mac layer talks directly to the application layer. This is a very common structure that's taken by people who need to increase performance and don't have a lot of horsepower in their CPU to drive the stack. But that all comes at a cost. In all of the features, the networking, the transport, the session, the presentation layer, there are features that are contained in, that, in those layers that become missing when you do an enhanced performance architecture. When you go to this enhanced performance architecture, you're assuming that you know exactly what you're getting and how the application is going to use it. And it's not filtered in any way so that it can be used by multiple applications or shared. Now, we're going to talk about the silicon stack on XMC. And this is where our new module, the XMC 6260, comes in. And our design engineer, Erica Zybot, is here to talk about some of the features of that module and how it can be used. Erica, take it away. Thank you, Roland. <clears throat> OK. So with our Acromag XMC 6260, as Roland said, it's a silicon stack on an XMC. No standard capabilities need to be compromised with this card. We can use both IPv4 and IPv6 switching and routing. And we have the capability to use four different transmission protocols. There is TCP, UDP, iSCSI, and FCOE. So not only can you communicate with file-oriented storage with this card, but you can also communicate with the block-level storage with this card. Um, so you can communicate with the SANS storage. Um, and this is why we often call it a unified wire as well. Okay, so here we have a performance comparison of our silicon stack to a software stack. Our throughput per port sustained in megabytes per second for the silicon stack is around 2,500 and that's full duplex. For the software stack, you will only get 40 megabytes per second, and this is because it's CPU limited. So even if you have a multi-core computer and you're dedicating a full single core to the software stack, you are still going to be CPU limited at 40 megabytes per second. Um, the host overhead, as we were saying, is very low for the silicon stack and very high for the software stack. Um, it's, it takes takes a lot of overhead to process these packets. Uh, the latency for the silicon stack is around 10 microseconds for the silicon stack and 250 microseconds for the software stack. Uh, the determinism, the typical variation in the latency, uh, we have plus or minus 2 microseconds for the silicon stack and plus or minus 200 microseconds for the software stack. And reliability under load the silicon stack will be excellent under any load condition. However, the software stack can be very poor under heavy loads. Um, if the CPU, the CPU is loaded with other tasks, your performance will take a hit. Here we have a block diagram of the XMC 6260 CC architecture. Over here you can see our P15 connector on the XMC. This is where you see our PCIe bus. Um, this is all PCIe 2.0, and it's it's um, eight lanes of PCIe Gen 2, five gigabits per second per lane. So you'll get around 40, 40 gigabits per second throughput, 32 with the 8B, 10B encoding. And we also have our SMB interface in, on P15. Our serial E prom has stores our configuration files for the PCIe and the ASIC as well. The serial flash has our firmware for our ASIC. The reset is actually a software reset. The 50 megahertz crystal is used to power the ASIC. The, these DC to DC converters 
take 12 or 5 volts from the P15 connector and convert those to 1 volt, 1.2 volts, 1.5 volts, 2.5, and 3.3. These are all used by the ASIC. And then over here on our right, we have our P16, which is dual, which is our dual Zowie links. Um, and then these are routed to the black back plane. And on top here, we have our DDR3. Um, this allows for our 1 million offloaded connections. It stores all the connection info and all of the buffers. This is a little bit of what was on the last slide as well. We, again, we have a single wide XMC module using a maximum of eight PCIe lanes at Gen 2 speeds. Uh, we could also use four lanes if you need to as well. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that the, uh, the performance will be affected. Um, and it will also downgrade to Gen 1 speeds. Um, we're using two Zali channels on P16, and each of those is capable of supporting a switch. We support up to 1 million connections with our 5 gigabits of DDR3 memory. Our Zali to switch latency, as I said before, is 10 microseconds end to end, and the determinism is plus or two microseconds, plus or minus two microseconds. Oh, this is built to be a recognized board for defense and military purposes. Uh, the operating conditions are negative 40 to 85 degrees, but keep in mind with the 85 degrees, you will need the proper conduction cooling uh, chassis to go along with that. Um, the board does dissipate about 14 watts of power depending on the application, so it can run a little bit, a little on the warm side. Make sure that you have this conduction cooling. Um, and this is also compatible with VPX and other PCIe Ethernet chassis architectures. Here's a little bit of our XMC6260 software overview. We have numerous operating systems supported. Keep in mind that these are all 64-bit only. Uh, we support Windows 7, Windows Server 2012, and others, and the most recent release of the drive, there, there, there's also Windows 8 and um, and Windows 2008. Just make sure that you contact us to be sure that the driver is compatible with what you want to do with the card. We also have Linux drivers. So we have Red Hat Enterprise, um, Fedora, a whole bunch of different operating systems. Be sure to contact us. Um, we support 1 million connections, complete and flexible TCP offload per connection. Uh, you can have one connection which is offloaded and another is, that is not, if you'd rather have it that way. We have zero copy direct data, direct data placement, which is also known as iWARP or RDMA. And this is a remote direct memory access. So you can remotely access the memory of another computer without CPU intervention. Uh, we have traffic filtering and management and also packet switching and routing. Another great feature about this card is the traffic filtering and management capabilities. Um, we have this end-to-end -end quality of service where you can give a certain channel a high priority over other channels. And you can see that right here. Um, you can guarantee low latency in the presence of high band bandwidth data mover traffic. You can control the maximum bandwidth that a connection flow or class can use. So um, you can allocate certain amounts of bandwidth to different channels. Well, that's what this is. Allocate available bandwidth to several connections or flows based on desired levels of performance. So if you have a very important connection that needs to get through and others say you have a video that may require high bandwidth but it's not so important, you can Make sure you prioritize your channels accordingly so you, you'll have good quality of service. And then, this price on this guy is uh, $27.50. Of course, we have quantity discounts. It's available only from Acromag. Uh, we're taking orders today. and Pretty much we're available in stock to three weeks thereabouts. Um, so, we expect, and we've got a couple of people who are very excited about it, especially the IDRMA feature right now. So we're looking forward to having a, 
a good run, and I think this is going to help a lot of people's architectures to become a lot more efficient than they are today. Okay. Well, then we'd like to say thank you very, very much for attending, and uh, keep in tune. We'll have some new information and new products available as the days go by, and uh, if you ever do have a question, please feel free to give us a call um, or email us, 